Kent McNeil is a distinguished research professor at Osgoode Hall Law School in Toronto, where he has taught some emerging justice essays on Indigenous rights in Canada and Australia. He has also co-edited a collection, Indigenous Peoples and the Law, Comparative and Critical Perspectives, with Professors Benjamin Richardson and Shin Amai. Mr. McNeil. To start by acknowledging uh, the Treaty 1 people on whose territory uh, we are meeting today, uh, my own talk is going to be rather legalistic, and as was Robert's, but mine is more from an academic perspective rather than uh, a practitioner's or a governmental perspective. Just a, a, a note on pronunciation. Uh, uh, Chilcotin, that's the way I've pronounced that ever since the trial judge came down whenever that was, six or seven years ago, uh, Justice Vickers' judgment. Uh, but I was meeting with some uh, Chilcotin chiefs out in BC just last week, and they told me, and I was politely corrected on this, and someone even wrote it down for me phonetically, that the correct pronunciation is actually Silcotin, not Chilcotin. Um, and just on this, I should tell you that my... My 15-year-old daughter often corrects my pronunciation. And when I tell her, well, you know, some words, there are two ways of pronouncing them. And she says, yeah, Dad, that's right. There's the right way and there's your way, right? <laughs> so um, I'm, I may switch back and forth because now my head's confused, right? But I am going to use the pronunci uh, try to use the pronunciation that I was told by the Silcotin themselves. Well, Heather's outlined uh, the province of Manitoba's arguments on interjurisdictional immunity uh, before the Supreme Court in both the, the Kiwaitin and the Silcotin uh, decisions. And as she indicated, the Supreme Court accepted those arguments and held that the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity no longer applies in the context of Aboriginal and treaty rights. And I'd like to congratulate Heather on her winning argument in those cases, and also Mitch McAdam, I think, who's in the audience, I see him over there, who made similar arguments for the Attorney General of Saskatchewan. According to Chief Justice McLaughlin, and she delivered the unanimous judgment in both of these cases, Aboriginal and treaty rights are adequately protected by Section 35 of the Constitution Act 1982, and by the Sparrow Justification Test. So in so doing, as Heather explained, the Supreme Court overruled this aspect of the Morris decision, decided by the Supreme Court only eight years before. And on that issue, on interjurisdiction immunity, the Supreme Court was unanimous. So that's a major shift in the law by the Supreme Court in a very short period of time. Well, with all due respect to the Supreme Court, I do find it odd that a constitutional provision, namely Section 35, that was enacted in order to provide additional protection to Aboriginal and treaty rights, actually now has taken away the division of powers protection that they formerly uh, enjoyed under interjurisdictional immunity because interjurisdictional immunity was not subject to a justification test, unlike Section 35. But of course, the Supreme Court has spoken and they get to tell us what the law is and we have to, at least as legal practitioners, I know Ovid has a different view and I really appreciated. Uh, hearing that different view, but as legal pr practitioners, we're we, we have to accept basically what the Supreme Court says, even though we may criticize it. Okay. Um, so, according to the Silcotin and um, Grassy Narrows decision, provincial legislatures do have the constitutional authority to infringe Aboriginal and treaty rights, as long as they can justify the infringement. However, this does not take into account Section 88 of the Indian Act, 
Uh, and I'm going to come back to Section 88 later, but it's not mentioned in either of these judgments. But before doing that, a question I would like to pose regarding interjurisdictional immunity is whether the court's rejection of it is retroactive. In other words, what about infringements by provinces that took place prior to the Chilcotin decision? What time, at what period of time did interjurisdiction immunity cease to apply to Aboriginal treaty rights? Well, McLaughlin's rejection of the application of the doctrine in this context is clearly based, based on her decision that post-1982, Section 35 and the justification test provides adequate protection to Aboriginal and treaty rights. So as I read her judgment, she did not retroactively discard the application of the doctrine to Aboriginal title prior to 1982. On the contrary, near the end of her judgment, she said that, and I'm going to quote here, she said where there is, quote, conflict between the federal and provincial levels of government, that that is appropriately dealt with by the doctrines of paramountcy and interjurisdictional immunity where precedent supports this. And there are, in fact, strong precedents that use the doctrine of interjurisdiction immunity in context outside of Section 35 rights. Uh, and I can just mention a couple of cases, the R versus Dick case in 1980 and the Derrickson and Derrickson case in 1986. And Chief Justice McLaughlin in Silco Teen did not mention, let alone overrule, these decisions. But somewhere between 1982 and the Silco Teen decision, the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity has ceased to apply to Aboriginal and treaty rights. Well, I think this only happened when the Silco Teen decision itself came down, because up to then, the law was the law as stated in the Morris decision. Okay, they didn't overrule Morris retroactively. Instead, um, I'm looking for the quotation here. Yeah, instead, McLaughlin said in, that, that Morris should and these are the exact words in Silco Teen, should no longer be followed in this regard. She didn't say it had been wrongly decided. Well, the court rarely says they have wrongly decided a case, but that, that is the wording. So I think the provinces shouldn't be able to justify infringements of Aboriginal treaty rights that took place prior to the Chilco Teen decision, and certainly not prior to 1982, when Section 35, according to the court, gave adequate protection to Aboriginal treaty rights. Okay, um, moving on from that issue of interjurisdictional immunity, uh, that's not the only protection provided by Section 9124. Um, there are two other protections. And one is, of course, the paramountcy doctrine. So if there's federal legislation that is an operational conflict with provincial legislation, the federal legislation prevails. And that would apply in relation to Aboriginal and treaty rights. And this is actually relevant, I think, to Section 88 of the Indian Act. Secondly, the provinces should not be able to legislate directly in relation to Aboriginal and treaty rights. That would cross the line. That legislation would be ultra virus because it would directly invade uh, federal jurisdiction. And that's not dependent on the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity. Nonetheless, uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin, in the Silco Teen decision, suggested that the BC Forest Act could apply to Aboriginal title lands if the provincial legislature were, quote, to amend the act to cover lands held under Aboriginal title 
provided it observes applicable constitutional restraints. How, I wonder, could the province do that without singling out Aboriginal title lands for special treatment and crossing the line into federal jurisdiction? So that, for me, is... It could be done, perhaps, with some clever legislative drafting, but I don't think that that is going to be so simple. I do want to say a few things about the BC Forest Act, even though that's provincial legislation that doesn't apply here in Manitoba, uh, because the Supreme Court's decision on the application of that act relates both to the province's underlying title to Aboriginal title lands and to the application of provincial laws. So in Chilcotin, McLaughlin decided that after Aboriginal title is established, the Forest Act would no longer apply to Aboriginal title lands because those lands would not be crown lands and the timber on them would not be crown timber according to the definitions of those in the statute itself. And that's a matter of statutory interpretation. However, in considering whether the BC legislature thought that lands subject to unproven Aboriginal title were Crown lands, she concluded that those lands would have been so regarded by the legislature because they would have been regarded as being vested in the Crown, and so the Forest Act would apply to them until Aboriginal title is proven or acknowledged. Um, I just need to read a quotation on this because this is what she actually says. She says, I conclude that the legislature intended the Forest Act to apply to lands under claims for Aboriginal title up to the time title is confirmed by agreement or court order. To hold otherwise would be to accept that the legislature intended the forests on such lands to be wholly unregulated and would undercut the premise on which the duty to consult affirmed in Haida was based. Then she goes on to say, once Aboriginal title is confirmed, however, the lands are vested in the Aboriginal group and are no longer crown lands. Now, how can land shift from being vested in the crown to being vested in Aboriginal nations at the moment Aboriginal title is established? Uh, this, this is a puzzle to me, if that's what the Chief Justice meant. Um, we know that Aboriginal title in British Columbia is based on exclusive occupation of land at the time of Crown assertion of, 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 assertion of sovereignty in 1846. And in the Dalgamook decision, Chief Justice Lemaire said that's when Aboriginal title crystallizes. So if it crystallized in 1846, how can it only vest when Aboriginal title is in fact proven in court? And how can these lands be crown lands up until that time? Okay. Well, in my respectful opinion, this aspect of Chief Justice McLaughlin's judgment is more pragmatic, pragmatic than principled. Uh, as she herself stated, the court was concerned about the existence of a legal vacuum if the Forest Act did not apply before Aboriginal title is established. The same concern was a reason for the Supreme Court's rejection of the application of the Doctor of Interjurisdictional Immunity in the modern air. She stated, Applying the doctrine of interjurisdictional immunity to exclude provincial regulation of force on Aboriginal title lands would produce uneven, undesirable results and may lead to legislative vacuums. The result would be patchwork regulation of force, some areas of the province regulated under provincial legislation and others under federal legislation or no legislation at all. And this very much follows the argument of the province of Manitoba. Well, in my respectful opinion, these concerns over legislative vacuums 
reveal a continuing mistrust in the capacity of Aboriginal peoples to manage resources on their own lands. Self-regulation is an important aspect of Aboriginal governance. And this, I think, is a matter that the Supreme Court did not take sufficient account of in either of these decisions. Uh, the passage from uh, Silk Poteen that I quoted just a moment ago unfortunately suggests that in the absence of provincial or federal regulation, there would be no regulation at all. Well, what about the capacity of First Nations to regulate their own lands and resources, uh, as uh, Ovid Mercredi spoke to us about before? So that's com completely missing here, right? So no provincial law, no federal law, no law. Well, what about Aboriginal law? Okay, I, I now want to raise another question. Um, is the Kiwetan decision really a Trojan horse for the provinces? In a talk at Osgoode Hall Law School uh, just last month on October 29th, uh, Carrie Wilkins, who used to be a crown lawyer for the province of Ontario, but he's now retired, so he can speak even more freely than he has in the past. He's been quite outspoken on this division of powers issue before. But he suggested in his talk that it might be a Trojan horse. Remember those old Privy Council decisions uh, from mainly, it was late uh, 19th, early 20th centuries that came after the St. Catherine's Milling case that held that the provinces because they were not involved in the negotiation of the treaties, uh, took the benefit of them because the burden of Aboriginal title was removed from the Crown's underlying title that belonged to the province. So they took the benefit, but the Privy Council said they don't have to bear any of the cost. They don't have to pay the annuities. They didn't even have to provide lands for reserves as had been promised in the treaties. And of course, that got resolved by, by agreement between uh, the province and, 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 and Canada in Ontario. But in Kiwetan, the Supreme Court decided that the treaties have to be interpreted in accordance with Canada's evolving constitution. And this means that the provinces now have powers they didn't used to have. For example, the power to infringe treaty rights subject to Section 88 of the Indian Act. But it could also mean that the provinces now have obligations that they didn't have before. You know, authority and power and rights are one thing. They usually come with obligations. In Kiwetan itself, Chief Justice McLaughlin said this, quote, the provinces made, sorry, the promises made in Treaty 3 were promises of the crown. Remember, the court held that the treaty was with the Crown, not with the federal government. There are promises of the Crown, not those of Canada. Both levels of government are responsible for fulfilling these promises when acting within the division of powers under the Constitution Act 1867. And given that the Supreme Court is willing to overrule aspects of its own decision in Morris made only eight years ago, surely it's willing to overrule outdated Privy Council decisions from over a hundred years ago. It, especially, you know, the St. Catharines itself has been overruled in various aspects. Certainly the, the description of title in St. Catharines was overruled in the Dalgamook decision. So I think and this is Kerry Welcome's argument, so I'm boring it from his talk, but I think it is worth consideration, particularly regarding treaty obligations, such as the obligation to provide a school on the reserve, education in other words, or in the case of Treaty 6, the requirement to provide medical services to the First Nations parties to those treaties. And we all know that these kind of services on reserves, especially education, is chronically underfunded by the federal government. Well, maybe the provinces have some obligations 
here as well. Okay, I now want to turn to the impact of Kiwetin and Silcoteen on Section 88 of the Indian Act. So where Aboriginal rights are concerned, I think Section 8 is probably obsolete. Okay, and this is because in the Dick decision in 1985, the Supreme Court decided that the only provincial laws that are referentially incorporated into federal law by Section 88 are those that would not apply to Indians, as defined in the Indian Act, of their own force. So if the provincial laws can apply of their own force, they don't need Section 88. They don't get referentially incorporated into federal law. But now, the Supreme Court in Silcoteen has decided that print provincial laws can apply of their own force even if they infringe Aboriginal rights, as long as the infringement can be justified. So given that these infringing provincial laws can apply their own force, Section 88 is no longer needed to make them apply to, again, Indians is the word in the section. In Kiwetin, the Supreme Court applied its rejection of interjurisdictional immunity from Silcoteen to treaty rights without any discussion or analysis. And it didn't even mention Section 88 of the Indian Act. So um, maybe Robert can help me out with this. I don't know if Section 88 was ever argued. It was argued before the Supreme Court even in the written arguments. Okay, okay. So, okay. So I find it surprising that they don't even mention it because, you know, the opening words of Section 88 are subject to the terms of any treaty, and then it goes on to provide that print provincial laws of general application apply to Indians. Now, it could be argued that this protection of treaty rights only applies as against provincial laws that would otherwise uh, be referentially incorporated by Section 88. So on this argument, if print provincial laws apply of their own force, Section 88 isn't necessary to make them apply, and so it provides them with no protection against provincial laws. But I think this argument is wrong. I think it's dead wrong. You go back to the Dick decision, which is the one that decided this issue about provincial laws applying to their own force, not getting referentially incorporated, and it did not involve treaty rights. It involved hunting rights. Today, we would probably classify the rights there as Section 35 hunting rights, but Section 35 wasn't relied on in that case. But just three weeks after the Dick case was decided, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in the Queen versus Simon, which involved Section 88 directly and the court found that Section 88 uh, protects treaty hunting rights, I think it was in, in Nova Scotia, against provincial laws, period. Okay, And those two cases, Dick and Simon, were actually argued before the Supreme Court only one week apart in 1984, and then the decisions come down three weeks apart. So the Supreme Court obviously had both of these cases in both of these situations in mind. Yet in Simon, the court held that Section 88 protects treaty hunting rights against provincial legislation. And no mention was made of the Dick decision only three weeks before. Instead, the Supreme Court referred to about a dozen other cases where Section 88 had been used to provide treaty hunting rights with complete protection against provincial laws. Okay, um, let me just read a short quote from Dixon, Chief Justice Dixon, in the Simon case. Near the end, he says, I conclude that the appellant has a valid treaty right to hunt under the Treaty of 1752, which by virtue of Section 88 of the Indian Act cannot be restricted by provincial legislation, period. Right? After that comes the CUE decision in 1990, another unanimous decision of the Supreme Court 
where Chief Justice Lemaire, or Justice Lemaire at the time, said, quote, Section 88 of the Indian Act is designed specifically to protect Indians from provincial legislation that might attempt to deprive them of rights protected by a treaty. I could say something about Morse in this regard. I think I'm going to skip over that for lack of time. Uh, but I don't think Morse in any way contradicts this. And this Section 88 uh, analysis, as I said, is not dealt with at all in the uh, Supreme Court decision in either of these cases. Okay. The third topic I was going to address, so that's it for Section 88. Um, and I'd like to hear some discussion. I'm sure there's some disagreement and so on in the room over my analysis of that. Um, the third topic I was going to discuss is the unity of the crown issue coming out of Kiwaitan. And, uh, you know, Robert mentioned that, that the court held that the treaty is with, uh, with the crown, not with Canada, not with Ontario. Obviously, they weren't even there at the table, but it's a treaty between the Crown and the First Nations who entered into that treaty. And the exercise of the powers is by the government that has constitutional authority under the Constitution Act 1867. And yeah, as we've seen, they said that that means that the province can take up lands uh, provided they by Bion or the Crown and so on, but they can take up lands under the treaty without the participation or the consent of, uh, of Canada. I have problems with this unity of the Crown, and I'm only going to speak about this briefly because I'm looking at the time here. But, um, and I have a longer, pa I have actually a written paper on this that I'm going to post uh, either on SSRN or the Osgood uh, Digital Commons. Um, so post it online. But the unity of the crown that gets applied here by the Supreme Court in Kiwaitan comes from the St. Catherine's decision in 1888 by the Privy Council. But it's completely outdated. And there are several cases that went to the Supreme Court where unity of the crown was argued by the First Nations and just basically gets dismissed. Uh, don't have time to go into those, but there's a lot of discussion of them in, in that paper of mine. Also, when First Nations went to London in 1981, 1982 to oppose patriation of the Constitution, they actually went to the English courts, and the English Court of Appeal, you know, they argued our treaty is with the Crown, and that means with her Majesty, and Her Majesty is here in London. We have this treaty relationship, nation to nation. Uh, and what did the Court of Appeal in London say? They said, things have changed. You know, Canada is an independent country. You know, the crown is no longer indivisible, and so on. So when the argument would have favored First Nations there, it gets rejected. And similarly in a number of Supreme Court decisions. But when unity of the crown is actually to the disadvantage of First Nations, then it gets relied on. And that's what happens in the Kiwaitan case. Uh, and I find that extremely problematic, right? You, you shouldn't be switching back and forth depending on whose interests are being preserved. Okay, I'm just going to wrap up now. But I, I think that on this issue of division of powers in Silcoteen and in Kiwaitan, you know, the bottom line here is that Canada does not want jurisdiction in these areas. It argued on the side of the provinces in relation to interjurisdictional immunity. It wants out of it, and it wants the provinces to have the authority, and the Supreme Court has, in fact, supported that. And I think it's all about resource development and provincial authority over resource development. And the Supreme Court wants to see that able to go ahead 
as long as it's done respectfully of aboriginal and, and treaty rights. So it's trying to strike some kind of balance there. But as I said, I see several problems with these decisions. So thank you for being so patient.